Peter is the Chief Global Strategist for Euro-Pacific Asset Management. Peter Schiff, welcome back to the show. Oh, uh, thanks, Megan, for having me on again. It's always a pleasure. My, the pleasure's all mine. So let me start with this. Our president, Joe Biden, is feeling optimistic about the economy. He's feeling kind of sunny. Here's how he summed up our, our soon-to-be-experienced um, interaction with the economy. Listen to this. What I'm most excited about is people are starting to feel a sense of optimism as they see the impact of the achievements in their own lives. It's going to accelerate in months ahead. And as part of the broad story about the economy we're building that works for everyone. Now, so, so reason to feel good. Uh, I understand you don't agree. Well, remember, incumbent and presidents always claim that the economy is great while they're in office. You know, if the circumstances were identical and Donald Trump was still president, Biden would be criticizing the very economy that he's now touting. So how are we doing, though? Because I, I understand, I mean, we had some warnings, right? D Jamie Dimon, uh, the J.P. Morgan CEO, said inflation could tip the economy into a recession next year. I, you, you seem to think he's understating it. Yeah, well, I think the economy is in horrible shape. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons that President Biden is so unpopular, because I think a lot of the people who are struggling in this economy uh, in part, blame the president. He's not solely responsible, but he certainly hasn't done anything to help. Everything he's done has actually taken a bad situation and made it worse. But if you look objectively at the data, the savings rate is at the lowest it's been since 2007. I think it's down to 2.3 percent. So Americans have blown through all their stimulus money, and now they're pretty much broke. If you look at credit card debt, it's at an all-time record high. So Americans are struggling to put food on the table and to pay the electric bill, and so they're borrowing more money on their credit cards. If you look at what's happening to wages, they are declining in real terms. And I think the real decline is being masked by the fact that we are understating inflation. I think mm -hmm. the actual inflation rate is about double what the government will admit to. And that means that the real decline in wages is much greater, which explains why so many people are now moonlighting. A record number of Americans have two and three jobs. In fact, you have more Americans than ever that are working two full-time jobs. Most people don't want multiple jobs. They would prefer to be able to support themselves and their family on one job. But unfortunately, in the Biden economy, that's not possible. And that's where all these jobs that are being created are going. They're going to people who don't want more jobs, but who are forced to take them anyway, because that's the only way that they can keep up with the rising cost of living. That's amazing because the jobs report has been touted, this, the November jobs report has been touted by the administration and even some of their critics as as the sign of something good to come. The, <laughs> um, the November report said the labor market looks strong, the economy added 263,000 jobs in November, well above the 200,000 job projection. And at the employment rate now, very flat at 3.7%. Uh, and that led the president to brag about how they're creating jobs. And you can hear him sounding very optimistic. Those numbers on paper, they do look good. But you're saying you have to dig a little, little deeper. Yeah, they're being very disingenuous. And that's a nice way of putting it about these numbers. Because the, the implication is that, oh, uh, 260,000 people who didn't have jobs, who were unemployed, now they've got jobs. That's not what happened. All of those jobs went to people who were already employed. They are part-time jobs. That's what's happening. And it's not a great economy where people who have jobs need to get a second job. They would rather have mm. the leisure. They would rather be able to spend more time with their families. But unfortunately, they can't afford that. They have to go and get another job. And that is where these jobs are coming from. If people come out of retirement, Let's say somebody was retired, they're 70 years old, they were looking forward uh, to just playing golf and going to the beach and hanging out with their grandkids, but now they have to go take a job at Target because that's the only way to pay the grocery bill. Do you want to brag about creating an economy where unemployed people are forced to go back into the workforce? 
Hmm. Well, what about the unemployment rate, right? They're saying it's nice and low, 3.7%. Um, you know, this is some employers complain about this because they say they can't find good workers. That suggests all the jobs are filled and, you know, people are working to the extent they want to work. Well, the main reason that the unemployment rate is so low is so many people who aren't working are not counted as being unemployed. We have over 100 million working age Americans who are no longer in the labor market. The labor force participation Isn't that by choice, rate, though? Isn't, yeah. that, isn't that now? The, the, the current narrative is that those people, unlike in some past, you know, low economic periods where they couldn't get jobs, they, they, people weren't whatever. These are supposedly people who have decided, you know, post pandemic, they saw the light. They love the couch. <laughs> they want to sit there. They could take a job, but they've just decided to be in their happy place when it comes to workload now. Yeah, well, I'm sure for some people that may be the case. Maybe they have a better alternative. Maybe they can live off of uh, welfare and uh, housing vouchers and uh, SNAP you know, benefits. Maybe they find that uh, a better alternative than having to actually work for a living. But I'm sure a lot of the people there are just discouraged workers. You, know, you, you, don't, you don't count. If you've basically given up looking for a job because you don't think there's a job out there that you're qualified for uh, at a wage that you know, makes sense for you to take the job, after a year, you don't count. Uh, even in the U6 number, which, you know, which is not the, the number that you just cited. If you look at the, the U6 number, which includes discouraged workers and people who are only working part time, but would prefer to work full time and who are still looking for full time employment, but can't find it there. The unemployment rate, I think, is closer to 7 percent. But even that unemployment rate, once you've been discouraged for over a year, you're no longer counted in that number either. So I think if you objectively measured the unemployment rate and included all the people who are not working, but who would be working if they believe they can find a job or who have settled for a part time job uh, when they would prefer a full time job, I'm sure the actual unemployment rate is in the double digits. Hmm. What what about you mentioned the savings and the reports I read CNBC claims that consumers have 1.5 trillion right now in excess savings from the pandemic stimulus stimulus programs but that it's going to run out at some point soon but if 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 they've got 1.5 trillion still right now in excess savings I mean how does that compare to where we were and it doesn't support what you said which is that money ran out yeah, the savings rate, again, is 2.3%. That's the most recent number that was released last week by the government. Uh, we haven't had savings that low since 2005. But one of the reasons that Americans weren't saving in 2005 is because they had so much home equity. Uh, they were just getting rich mm. off the real estate. That was the peak of the real estate bubble. But right now, Americans are losing their home equity. Real estate prices are now falling. But what's more problematic is real wages are falling because the cost of living is going up and credit card debt has exploded. So if yeah. Americans really had all this savings, uh, credit card debt wouldn't be skyrocketing. The reason credit card debt is going up so much is because people don't have savings. They can't afford to buy things. They have to borrow the money. But more of the money that, the, that they're borrowing is being spent on food. It's being spent on electricity, on gas. I mean, look at all the big retailers uh, that are reporting that their that their customers are spending more money on food and less money on everything else because food is so expensive. The the credit card situation is scary. Um, I have been in deep credit card debt back in my law school days when I had to put myself through school and support myself at the same time, and um, it's a sickening feeling to see those cards run up and the people who run it up. Yes, there are some who are just spendthrifts, but the vast majority of people, I think, who have enormous credit card debt are buying things they do need, and they'd rather not have it on credit, but they don't have the cash. And it's it's stomach-turning to see the bills run up and to see the interest rates go up, and the interest rates go up and up and up, and I can only imagine it would make people feel kind of angry at the Fed for, you know, every time they raise one of these rates, you owe more. Yeah, you're looking at credit card rates now that are about 20%. And that is a huge amount of interest to pay. And, you know, I think a lot of people today have a lot more consumer debt 
than just their credit card debt. Because over the last few years, a lot of these buy now, pay later companies have come into existence. And so people are using those companies to buy stuff without money, but it doesn't show up in the credit card numbers because it's not credit card debt, but it's still debt that the consumer is obligated to repay. And I don't believe they're going to be able to do it. Hmm. I mean, the, it seems insurmountable. So as you see these credit card uh, repayments get to these astronomical levels where people are not going to be able to pay that, they're just not. What happens? You know, do, is there some credit card default crisis that is the mirror image of the housing crisis? You referenced 2005 and going into the 2008 collapse. What's going to happen with all that credit card debt? Yeah, you know, the credit card debt is non-secure. So if you don't pay it, the credit card company, you know, they can't come after your assets. They can't put a lien on your house or try to go after your, your IRA. Uh, so the debt is, you know, very difficult to collect if the person doesn't have any money. And it, there, it's also dischargeable in bankruptcy. So we haven't seen a big spike up in credit card delinquencies, but I think that's coming in 2023. And, you know, what also happens with credit card debt is once somebody with credit card debt recognizes that they can't pay it back and they've decided they're not going to pay it back or that they're going to file for bankruptcy, what they will do before is max out their credit cards. They'll just borrow as mm -hmm. much money as they can because whatever they're buying, they're getting for free, right? So if you're planning on going bankrupt and you have 50,000 worth of credit card debt, but you still have another 50,000 that you can borrow, well, you're going to do it. You're going to go out and spend the other 50000 and buy as much stuff as you can. Because when you go bankrupt, you don't have to return that stuff. If you go out and you buy a bunch of clothes and some consumer electronics or take a vacation, and then you file for bankruptcy, you don't have to give any of that stuff back. And it makes sense that before you file for bankruptcy to buy as much as you can. Because once you declare bankruptcy, you're not going to get any new credit cards for a while. Uh, so That's you might right. as well buy everything you can before you go bankrupt. So you get that moral hazard that's going to accelerate the losses for the, 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 the banks that are issuing the credit. Mm, that is a moral hazard. So I don't explain to me why there are these predictions by you, by Jamie Dimon, of others of an impending recession when the Fed is doing everything it can to prevent that. It's raising interest rates every week, it seems now. It's up 4% now um, and more coming. So that's that was supposed to combat the amount of money flowing around in the economy, chasing too few goods uh, by saying to you know people who would otherwise have borrowed money or spent money, whoa, whoa, wait, I don't want to do that now. And we're seeing layoffs at companies. So it seems like, okay, that's part. That's maybe part of the plan. So isn't it? Is it not going according to plan? <laughs> well, I'm not even sure they have a plan, but I think we're already in a recession, and the rate increases that you're talking about are partially responsible for that recession. I think the recession is going to get a lot worse. Now, that doesn't mean the Fed shouldn't be raising rates. They should be. They should already have raised them a lot more than they have. The problem mm -hmm. was they never should have cut them. That was the mistake. Yeah. It was cutting rates. Raising them back up is really just an acknowledgement of that mistake. But what happens is when the Fed raises rates, it uncovers all of the problems that it created when it reduced rates. Because when it slashed interest rates to zero, it inflated a bubble economy. And it inflated it with inflation. Quantitative easing was inflation. It's just another word to describe inflation. It, it's just that a lot of people don't realize that it is inflation because inflation has a bad connotation to it. And so uh, quantitative easing uh, doesn't sound as bad. If the Fed said our policy is to create inflation, the public would have said, wait a minute, I don't want inflation. So if they say, well, mm -hmm. our policy is quantitative easing, then you don't have as many uh, people critical of the policy. But we're now experiencing the consequences of that inflation, rising prices, and prices still have a long way to go and that's one of the reasons I think that the recession is going to get a lot worse because more consumer income is going to be diverted uh, to necessities like food, energy, rent, insurance, things like that. And interest rates are going to have to keep rising. And that's also going to take a lot of purchasing power out of the economy. 
because people have to service their debt. And if you're spending money paying interest on the money you borrowed to buy stuff in the past, you have less money left over to buy stuff in the present and in the future. And that's what helps bring about a more severe recession. Mm. So what does all this do for, let's say, people, for their 401ks, the, the stock market? Because that's been all over the place. Well, most people's stock portfolios are going to continue to fall. Most people who own stocks, unfortunately, own the most overvalued stocks. Uh, big tech, for example, those are the stocks that went up the most because interest rates were zero and people thought that inflation would be low forever. Well, now that interest rates are not zero and inflation is here and getting worse, those stock valuations are coming down. I think they still have a long way to fall. So most people will lose money in the stock market. I think they'll fare even worse in the bond market. Uh, even though yields are higher now on bonds, they're not nearly high enough to offset inflation. So people are gonna lose a lot in bonds. So they have to start thinking outside the box and look towards alternative types of investing. You can still invest in stocks, but you can't invest in the indexes uh, that are so dominated by overpriced tech names. You have to, you know, be, you know, more discriminating in the stocks you buy. You have to select the stocks based on value and dividend yield and just build your own portfolio rather than just, you know, buying these indexes. And I think the best values are, are had abroad. I think the, the, the highest dividend yields are outside the U.S. And I think that also gives you the benefit of a hedge against what I believe is going to be a very weak U.S. dollar. Uh, the dollar is up on the year, but it's losing those gains rapidly. But I think over the next several years, we're going to see a very weak dollar as the markets come to terms with the re reality that inflation is not only going to get higher, but it's here to stay. It's not going back down to 2%. And mm. that's going to result in a run on the dollar, I think, and on U.S. dollar-denominated assets, especially when the Federal Reserve actually has to go back to quantitative easing, which is creating more inflation because the economy gets so bad that it actually turns into a financial crisis. And now the Fed is under a lot of pressure to try to stimulate the economy. But the only way it can do that is by creating even more inflation. Right, right. There, it's, it's it's not a good situation for them. And meanwhile, we're getting reports every day of more layoffs. When this is really concerning, I mean, right before Christmas, I just the pain of getting of losing your job with these kinds of numbers and this kind of inflation has got to hurt. These are just some examples uh, on the subject of investment banks. Uh, Morgan Stanley reportedly laying off two percent of its global staff. That's around two thousand of its people. BuzzFeed, the uh, journalistic operation, they're expected to lay off about 180 employees. It's not just BuzzFeed, they own HuffPo and some other networks. Pepsi, uh, eliminating hundreds of jobs. This is according to Forbes.com. Gannett, parent company of USA Today, Detroit Free Press and others, has begun laying off employees, uh, estimated to affect about 6% of their 3,400 person media division. They already let go of 400 folks in August. CNN is cutting people by the day. They, I've read other reports suggesting could be hundreds of jobs they are lost. Amazon planning to lay off as many as 10,000 employees. My God. Disney's on a uh, hiring freeze or is about to implement one. Meta, Mark Zuckerberg's company, you know, formerly known as Facebook, is going to lay off 13% of its workforce or 11,000 employees. So people are losing their jobs. Now, yeah. just in layman's term, explain to me why. Why are we having all these layoffs? Well, first of all, just to point to the jobs that are being lost, these are full-time jobs, high-paying jobs with benefits. The jobs that we're creating are part-time jobs with low pay and no benefits. So mm -hmm. it's not you know, like an even trade-off when you look at the jobs we're losing and the jobs that are being created to replace those lost jobs. But I think this is just early in the, the layoffs. I think the layoffs are gonna be very widespread. And in fact, some companies are gonna be laying off 100% of their workforce because they're gonna be going bankrupt. But a lot of companies are gonna be laying off a lot of workers to avoid going bankrupt because they have to start cutting their costs. And one of the costs that they can cut is labor. And so when you cut your labor, you have to eliminate employer employees. And the reason for this is that companies' real sales are going down because their customers are broke. 
So they can't afford to buy as many products. And so the companies selling those products or services don't need as many workers uh, to help uh, provide those goods and services. And employers are looking at higher interest rates if they've borrowed money, which a lot of employers have borrowed money uh, to uh, buy capital equipment that they might need. Their rent might be going up on their office space and their other raw material costs are rising. And so they have to figure out how to get by because businesses need to generate a profit because that's the way the owners of the business uh, make money off the business. And if they don't have a profit, they have to figure out how to create one or they're going to go out of business. And so one way would be to scale back the, the size of the business. And that means uh, reducing your headcount. And that's going to go on across the economy. And of course, there are a lot of companies that never should have been created in the first place, that only were created as a consequence of monetary policy, of cheap money and the casino-like environment that the Fed created in the stock market. You have a lot of companies that have never made any money, but they have a lot like of what? employees. How were they Here's able to example. pay these employees if they had no money to pay them with? Well, they were selling stocks to investors and they were using that money uh, to pay their workers. But if the appetite for shares of money losing companies is no longer there, a lot of these companies aren't going to be able to stay in business. And to the extent that they can stay in business, it will only be if they can dramatically downsize their operations and start generating a profit. And that probably means they have to eliminate most of their workforce. Like what kinds of companies are you talking about? Well, a lot of these social media type companies or tech companies or, you know, last year, I think we had a record in money losing companies that went public. I mean, normally you wouldn't go public until you had been able to prove the viability of your company, that you're a profitable company and you just want to get more money so that you can scale it up. But you had all these companies that never proved anything other than the fact that they can lose money and they went public. And I think a lot of these companies are going to go from IPO to bankruptcy in a relatively short period of time. Mm. So do you think that these layoffs are, in fact, necessary? Because I read something suggesting they don't really need to be doing this. They're just using the downturn in the economy as an excuse to turf a lot of dead weight. Well, I mean, they don't need excuses. If, if employers are going to look at their workforce and if employees are not contributing to the company, then there's no reason to employ them. I mean, you hire somebody because they're going to help increase your profits. And so uh, employers are going to you know, objectively look at the value workers bring to the table and what it costs to employ them. And you know, if it's a losing proposition for the employer, then you know, the job is going to get eliminated. But you know, when workers are not employed productively, it, it's good for the economy if those jobs are eliminated. Because what happens is that worker is now freed up to do something else. Because if I'm working at a job, but I'm not actually adding value to the company, I'm subtracting value, then my, my labor is, is actually being wasted. I need my labor to be utilized more productively by another business that has a better use for it. But the problem is with all the government regulations and taxes, it's a lot harder uh, for uh, labor to go to its highest and best use. And so a lot of times people end up uh, trapped in, in, in an unemployed situation because of, of government. So I mentioned this is happening right around the holidays, which it's ne never a great time to get laid off, but right before the holidays is especially painful. So how's all of this affecting, like inflation right now, affecting holiday shopping? You know, we heard it was a record Black Friday, Cyber Monday. That's supposed to be a great stimulant. How, how does the holidays play into all this? Well, first of all, it was only record spending because of the inflation. And if you adjust it for inflation, oh, it wasn't a record really? at all. Uh, spending was down because prices were up. So if, 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 you're, if you're paying higher prices, then obviously you're spending more. But you could be buying less. You're just paying more for what you're buying. And that's what happened uh, on this uh, Black Friday or Cyber Monday. But I think the rest of the holiday season is going to be a dud from the point of view of the retailers. I think people are going to spend less. And layoffs, I think, are going to pick up quite a bit in January because I think employers are reluctant to lay people off uh, going into the holidays. I mean, nobody wants to be uh, Scrooge and, and, and do that. So I think that 
a lot of these decisions are postponed to January. And I, I would expect a lot of people are going to be getting pink slips if they still mail those things out in mm. uh, in, in January. And and for the they rest probably of text 2023. Them now. They, they DM you your, your pink slip. <laughs> what about housing, Peter? Because, you know, the housing market has held relatively steady over the past few years, even though there were some dire predictions. But you're starting to hear reports that um, it, that's shifting. The value of homes is going down. The sales prices are going down. Um, and that's something a lot of people watch very closely. So what, what do you predict there? Well, I mean, they have to go down. You know, people buy homes. The vast majority of Americans who buy homes uh, use a mortgage. They don't have the money to buy a house. They don't even have the money for a down payment. The average down payment uh, has been, I think, 5% now. It used to be 20%, but people don't have the savings to put down 20%. So uh, they're borrowing the money. So the most important factor in home affordability isn't the price of the house, but the mortgage rate. And mortgage rates, you know, a year ago were in the low threes. Now they're almost seven. You've, mm. you've had a doubling in the interest on a mortgage. And that dramatically reduces how much somebody could pay for a house. And, and so home prices are going to have to fall sharply because that's the only way anybody can afford to buy them. Now, of yeah. course, you know, there won't be a lot of homes on the market for a while because people are not going to build them because it's too expensive to build them and people can't afford to buy them. And a lot of the people who own homes don't want to leave because if they sell their house, they can't buy another one because the mortgage on the new house could be double the mortgage they have on their current house. So they're kind of stuck. So that's helping to mitigate the supply a bit. But ultimately, I think the prices are going to be determined by demand and what people are able to pay. And with higher mortgage rates, they're able to pay a lot less. And so prices are going to come down a lot. And that means home equity is going to vanish for a lot of people who you know, are in their homes. They're not going to have all that equity. And that's going to have a big impact psychologically on their saving and their spending, on their ability to use their house you know, as an asset uh, for a loan or something like that. But even though home prices are going to be coming down, the cost of home ownership is going to be going way up because even if you buy a house that's gone down 20 or 30%, based on where mortgages are, your monthly payment will still be higher than the payment would have been had you bought the house a year or two ago uh, mm. at a lower price, but with a much lower mortgage. But the mortgage is not the whole cost of home ownership. You got to pay insurance. Insurance rates are skyrocketing. I mean, the insurance on my own house in Connecticut in one year was up 40%. And people have Whoa. sent me uh, copies of their homeowner's insurance that has gone up a lot more than that. Uh, so insurance costs are skyrocketing. Maintenance costs, if something goes wrong with your house and you need to fix it, the cost of repairing anything, the parts, the material, the labor, all of that has gone way up. Property taxes are, are going up. Uh, your utility bill, the cost to heat the house, to air condition, everything is going up. So home ownership is getting a lot more expensive. And so fewer and fewer Americans will be able to afford to own a home, let alone buy one. So just to put a period on the end of that, after the pandemic, like kind of during the pandemic and then in 2021, we saw a rush to the suburbs, to more rural areas, to, you know, kinder, gentler nature riddled towns because people wanted to be outside and they were, they learned the hard way that it's not so great to be in a small apartment that where you can't leave. And those, those pockets, the homes went like this in value, right? You could get so much more for your home. Uh, if you were lucky enough to own one in an area like that. Uh, so is that over, you know, that, that sort of huge spike in, let's say you have a property in Florida or you have a property in the mountains or at the beach or, you know, just something more suburban and country-esque. Well, you know, there's still going to be some appeal from that perspective uh, to have a larger home where you can work from home uh, and you have more room for your kids if they're, you know, if they're homeschooled or something like that. But I think that a lot of the people who rushed from the cities and maybe they were renters and they bought places out in the country or the suburbs, 
they had no idea how expensive it really is to maintain those properties. Mm. Um, you know, I own some homes and I can tell you from experience, you know, they're, they're money pits. They cost a lot of money because it's stuff true. is constantly going wrong with constantly. your house. And, um, and, and so people probably bit off a lot more than they can chew. And if some of these people have buyer's remorse and maybe they want to sell their property, it's going to be difficult in an environment where interest rates have doubled. And of course, a lot of other potential homeowners are going to be losing their jobs. Uh, so unemployed people have a hard time making their mortgage payments. It's very hard, honestly. Like uh, in, We can pay our bills, but it's stressful even for us. So I can't imagine what it's like when you're really struggling paycheck to paycheck. I'm, I would Even at our house, there was a problem with the HVAC system. And those are expensive. <laughs> That's an expensive yes. fix. And my they're husband's always, looking at the bill like, always breaking. oh, I'm a G. And then... I just noticed that my sink in my bathroom sprung a leak and it was very leaky. And I just chose not to tell Doug because he was already kind of mad. <laughs> but then he made the mistake of using my sink and he found out anyway. I was like, oh, I was looking, just going to stick them, some gum on it. I don't, we're not particularly handy, he and I. So uh, I understand it's no laughing matter for any American. And uh, my heart goes out because it sounds like we're all going to be going from bad to worse. Um, listen, let's pick it up after this break. On I, I'm dying to talk to you about what's happening with crypto. You and I have talked about it before, but we haven't talked about SBF yet and what's happening with this guy. And now he's saying he will not testify before Congress, even though he'll speak to any s slobbering love affair media person, but he won't speak to Congress. So, Peter, crypto seems to be imploding, and certainly we've seen um, this Sam Bankman-Fried company, FTX, implode, officially filing for bankruptcy. And he has now lawyered up and how he's hired Ghislaine Maxwell's attorney to defend him. He's also saying, don't expect me anytime soon at your congressional hearings, which is probably the first sensible thing he has said since getting caught in this entire mess. And here's what's interesting to me. I know you're not a lawyer, but as a lawyer, you know, you're an economic expert. So it'd be a good discussion, I think, on this between the two of us. I can see him in these interviews repeatedly trying to lay the foundation for there was no intent I didn't know that this was going on. I'm a mismanager. I'm not a fraudier, fraudulent manager. And so that's why he made admissions like this one to George Stephanopoulos, which Stephanopoulos was like, oh, extraordinary. But really, it was 100% by design. Here's the soundbite. You said one of your great it's, talents in a podcast was managing risk. That's right. And well, it's obviously wrong. Well, I, it's, I think that there is something maybe even deeper wrong there, which was I wasn't even trying like i wasn't spending any time or effort trying to manage risk on ftx trying like and that that obviously that's that a was stunning a admission what that's a pretty stunning admission yeah i mean it i don't know what to say like what happened happened and like if i had been if i had been spending an hour a day thinking about risk management on ftx i don't think that would have happened i think i I stopped working as hard for a bit. You know, honestly, if I look back on myself, I think I got a little cocky. Okay, so why is he saying that? He's saying that because he had reportedly a $32 billion company that's now worth maybe zero. And there are billions of dollars of <clears throat> investor funds that are apparently missing and unaccounted for. And they're now bankrupt. And there's not only going to be civil lawsuits, we've already seen some filed, but there's going to be SEC actions. There's more than likely going to be criminal charges against him. And he's really hoping that fraud, criminal fraud, which is the big kahuna charge, does not get brought against him because he wasn't ill-minded. He was just absent-minded. Do you read it the same way? Yeah, well, first of all, I don't blame him for not wanting to testify before Congress. Because remember, if he does that, he's going to be under oath. And given the, the number of lies he's likely telling, I don't think he wants to add perjury to his list of crimes. But I also think he is ultimately hurting his defense by doing so many interviews because he's bound to contradict himself here and there. And he's probably undermining uh, some part of his future defense because he's putting out so much information. But, you know, if you're going to believe that this guy was an honest kid who was just a completely incompetent guy who had no idea what he was doing, um, you know, I have a hard time believing he was that ignorant and he was, you know, just uh, that naive. And, and 
And, and, you know, to me, it's even worse. If you think about all of the supposedly sophisticated uh, guys, hedge funds, investors that, that gave him money, that entrusted him with millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, if, he really, if they really entrusted their money with, with, with that much of a fool, I mean, to me, that's even worse than giving it to a con man who at least lied to you and then stole your money. If he was mm-hmm. just so incompetent and he lost it, uh, you know, it, it, but it just shows you how foolish the crypto community is and, and how much of their money is going to be lost. I mean, the fact that they were well, wait, well, hold that in, thought, hold that thought. I want to, I want to get to that one second, but I will say this. He seems to be setting up the ex-girlfriend for the fall. She's the one running, <laughs> well, who was running Alameda, the hedge fund that was like the sister company to his company, FTX. And it was FTX's money that was reportedly used to cover losses at Alameda and they were lovers too for a period of time. And he seems to be getting ready to say it was all her fault. She's the mismanager or the fraudster. I was just this scatterbrained, you know, boy genius. I set up the company that was working. Then she started funneling funds. And that's an interesting dynamic for a lawyer because then you're like, great, one of these people is going to flip on the other. So far, no one has. So far, none, none is in the country. They're all in the Bahamas or elsewhere. She's no longer in the Bahamas, reportedly. Um, and so you, you try to get to the first one you can and get him to flip ASAP. Yeah, like, I don't think the strategy of blaming the girlfriend is going to work. Uh, I think it's more likely that she's going to rat him out in exchange for immunity uh, because he's the bigger target. And, mm. I mean, who's going to believe that she was the mastermind of the whole thing? Uh, and he was just this innocent guy along for the ride. I mean, I mean, I mean nobody is going to believe that. Certainly, I don't think you're going to find a jury that's going to buy that. Well, what about the thing is, so, okay, if he doesn't get a fraud charge against him, you know, you're in this business, not crypto, but you think the business of investing, you are not allowed to misuse customer funds. If I give you funds and say, please invest, you can't then just take the money and go buy your Christmas presents with it. That that would be a misappropriation of funds. You have a fiduciary duty as a hedge fund manager to your clients. And there were explicit promises that the money would not be used in any way other than it was promised, which was on the FTX exchange. So eliminating malintent as an element that could be used against you does not save you from the criminal law. And I would imagine that virtually everybody who's in the investment business knows that. Yeah, well, you know, most of the losses, you know, the, the, the mom and pops who lost money, they weren't in a hedge fund. They, they were using uh, FTX as an exchange and they had deposited their, you know, crypto or whatever they, they held uh, with, uh, with FTX. Now, you know, when you put your uh, money with a bank, right? The, the bank makes a loan that takes your money and they loan it out and they, they could lose it. You're a creditor of a bank. Banks are allowed to loan out your money. What they're not allowed to do is take your money and use it, you know, just f- to go out and buy Christmas presents for the executives. I mean, but, they, but they, they are allowed to loan it out. And so the question is, what did Sam Bankman Freed represent to his customers was going to happen with their money or their tokens on his platform? Because, you know, if he's allowed well, I think to that, loan it. I think we know that. I think the answer is he represented to them, it will not be moved and it will not be used. It'll be here. Yeah. For when so you then if it. that's what he did, then yes, that's a fraud. It's civil fraud on the customers because the customers were told one thing and what he did, he did the opposite. Uh, but what would be theft, embezzlement, a real crime would be if he took that money out of those accounts and then bought, you know, a, a beach house in the Bahamas, right, for his own personal use, right? If that's what he one of the it. allegations, or he gave <laughs> it to Democratic uh, politicians for campaign donations, right? You're not you're not supposed to do that uh, with the money. That to me would seem to be a criminal uh, misuse of that money if you misappropriated mm-hmm. it, right, embezzled it, and then you you did something with it. Yeah, to, to giving it to politicians or to the media, which is the other group he tried to buy and and have be loyal to him. And they are still being loyal to him. If you look at the press coverage of this guy, it's absurd how the media has been bending over backwards to try to make excuses for this guy. Um, you know, even Andrew Ross Sorkin of CNBC, who gave him a challenging interview the other day at this New York Times summit, ended it in 
you know, the Bernie Goldberg slobbering love affair. It was like, you're saying goodbye right now to a guy who is accused of defrauding who knows how many investors of their hard-earned cash in a massive scheme that you hid from the entire world while you represented yourself to be some altruistic guy. Here's just as a sample. This was the toughest interview he's had yet. Here's how it ended. On behalf of everybody here and on behalf of the public, I want to thank you for engaging in it at a time, in truth, when I know you've been advised not to. So thank you so very, very much. Um, thank you. Sam Bankman Freed, everybody. And then applause. Yeah. Applause. That tells you what the audience thought about the tough interview. They they say no problem. They're like, yes, yeah. great. Thank you so much. F you. That's what they should have been saying. Screw yeah. you and the fraud you wrote in on. Obviously, the people clapping didn't have any money with FTX, or they would not be <laughs> be clapping at uh, at the interview. Because that's and look, Peter, can you imagine people cl clapping for Bernie Madoff? Yeah, Nobody thank you, would, Bernie, like they for would've... this for your gracious yeah, accepting this. You don't thank yeah. him. But if you go back and look at the way CNBC covered Bankman Freed for the last year or two, this guy was the second coming of Jesus as far as they were concerned. Yes. They were they were praising him. They they were never critical of anything he did. They never uh, took a skeptical position, uh, no matter how absurd some of the stuff that he was doing and claiming to do and the interviews. I mean, his whole personality was a lie. The whole thing was a con, this idea that he was this altruist that was earning to give, that he wanted nothing for himself, that he drove an old beat up Toyota Corolla and lived with 10 roommates uh, was absurd. This guy was living the high life uh, you know, in a penthouse in, in uh, Albany uh, with all the luxury. I mean, if you look at that house, Albany I mean, Resort. it would make Donald Trump blush. Look at some of the some of the pictures of how opulent this guy was living. And, and you know, he was not, you know, just, you know, some frugal uh, do-gooder who, you know, just cared about other people and, 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 you know, wanted nothing for himself. And that was all part of his lie. Uh, and now, you know, the media doesn't want to acknowledge how easily they were duped uh, by this guy. But Jim the, the worst part about it is I'm sure we're going to end up with more government regulation as a result of this. And that's the last thing we need. We don't need more government. We need less government. We need more personal responsibility. Individual mm -hmm. investors have to do their homework before they just throw their money to what is really an obvious fraud. This is not the government. The government would have prevented this from happening. Bernie Madoff was regulated have, by the SEC. Have. He was regulated by FINRA, and he pulled off a giant Ponzi scheme right under the nose of the regulators. You know, we didn't even have the SEC until 1934. The New York Stock Exchange started in, 1890, in 1796. So we, we had a New York Stock Exchange for almost 140 years without an SEC. And I think we had a better market back then. I think there was less fraud uh, before the SEC than there is with it. Hmm. He, and by the way, he wouldn't have been subject to those regulations anyway, because he was based in the Bahamas. So that, that wouldn't have solved it in his case. But yeah. So, um, let's, let's end it on a bigger discussion of crypto because his is not the only crypto firm to go down. You know, Bitcoin now is what, you know, one, Tenth of what it was a year ago. I'm trying to do the math in my head, but they're all going ah. down. Several declaring bankruptcy, folding. What's happening and what's going to happen in crypto? Well, crypto was a gigantic bubble. It was one of the bubbles that was a consequence of the Fed's cheap money policies. And when I we spoke earlier about a lot of companies that I think are going to be going bankrupt and laying off all their workers. That's pretty much going to be the case for almost every company in crypto and blockchain. Uh, these companies never should have been started, and they're going to go out of business, and all their employees are going to lose their jobs. And a lot of those employees <clears throat> own crypto, and they're going to be selling their crypto to pay their rent, to pay, to pay their bills. The air is coming out of this bubble. I mean, Bitcoin, uh, on its highs earlier in the year, got to almost 70,000 or up to 69,000. Now we're below 17,000, uh, but we still have a long way to fall. The market cap of all the crypto tokens was close to 3 trillion at its high. Now it's just above 800 billion, although over 100 billion of that, I think, is stable coins, <coughs> uh, which are just you know now tokens that supposedly are backed by the dollar, uh, like Tether. Uh, but who knows if Tether is actually backed? That could be another 
crisis in the making. But the reason a lot of these crypto exchanges went bankrupt is because they took on debt. Uh, they used a lot of leverage. That's how they were able to offer yield uh, to their uh, customers who were depositing their tokens and they were getting paid. Uh, they didn't realize how much risk uh, these companies were taking in order to generate that so-called yield. But mm. uh, now that these crypto prices are imploding, uh, the whole bubble is collapsing. And I think there's still a lot of people that are hopeful that Bitcoin, for example, is going to come back and it's going to make new highs and go to the moon. But those days are over. Uh, Bitcoin is crashing back down to earth. It's not crashing yet. It's kind of slowly grinding its way lower. Uh, but it will pick up the pace of the decline, I think, uh, in 2023, especially when Bitcoin gets below 10,000. I think there's a lot more leverage that needs to uh, come out. I think a lot of people are going to get margin calls or people are going to have to repay some debt. And Bitcoin is likely to be the collateral that needs to be sold. But I just don't see the buyers. You know, we had a peak buying in 2021. FTX wasn't the only crypto company to buy a Super Bowl ad. I think there were three others. Uh, but crypto companies were putting their names on sporting stadiums. They were paying off pop stars and athletes to pump their tokens. They even suckered in a whole country, El Salvador, into making it legal tender. You had the NFT mm. craze. Oh, my God. Um, a lot of stuff happened at the peak of the bubble, but all that has to be unwound as the air comes out. Wow. Well, you've been predicting this for a while. As you predicted, Elon Musk would not buy Twitter because it would hurt his financial fortune in a massive way and it wouldn't make economic sense. I thought of you when he tweeted, how do you make a small fortune in social media? Start out with a large one. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's Peter. an old joke. And, you know, I tweeted out, you know, uh, Elon Musk replied to it with like a smiley face. Like I said, look, as a customer of Twitter, I'm glad you bought it. I like Twitter better uh, now that Elon Musk owns it. But I pointed out it was not a smart business decision. Yeah, uh, I it, think he, he would agree and, with that. And he admitted. But the one thing he did right is he sold a bunch of Tesla stock to raise the money. And he, he got way more for his Tesla stock than it was you worth. You also so, predicted that's what he would have to do if he bought Twitter, so you called that as well. But but that worked out well because Tesla's down over 50%, and I think Tesla stock still has a way to fall. Hmm. Such a pleasure. Thank you, sir. My pleasure, as always. <laughs>